is the, our Vice President in charge of Substance Use Disorder Services, and he's going to also give us a welcome and share a few thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, say a few words here. It's nice to be with, with colleagues old and new at, uh, at the forum here. And <clears throat> what, what I wanted to, uh, just to say a few words about integration, if you excuse me while I wasn't as high tech as Sandra and put everything on paper, so I've got to uh, read from my computer. Um, but so here we are, you know, it's ACA plus nine months. So who's finished? Who's got to figure it out? You know, and, and I say that is, is that we, we must not underestimate the scope and magnitude of the, the transformation that we're starting now. Um, this is a process I think that'll be, you know, the, the challenge for, of our careers and, and for the people that come, come after us. Um, I think at the, one of the, the challenges we see is you know, moving out of our silos. And I think of a, a story probably apocryphal at a zoo in, in Europe. They had a polar bear and they decided to upgrade the, the, the enclosure for it. You know, had put in fancy new refrigeration system and an ice machine and all the nice stuff the polar bears like. But while they were doing it, they had to put him in a cage. So of course, it wouldn't eat the workers. And after it was finished, after you know, eight, 10 months, they took the cage off. Well, the polar bear continued to do what it did while it was in the cage, is walk around in a circle, walk the perimeter of that cage. I think we need to be thinking about the same thing as the barriers get removed as we take them down, that we need to look at what our new paths are. Uh, there are other systems out there as the silos, as the walls fall down. Um, <clears throat> we no longer need to be constrained and uh, we need to look at ourselves and think, okay, are, are we still creating mental boundaries here. Um, you know, I do a lot of work around the state and people ask me a lot about, you know, models of integration, who's doing good work, you know, integrating with primary care, integrating behavioral health and, you know, mental health and substance use. And I'll suggest, oh, you know, county, this county over here's got a good one or that county's got, is doing some really interesting things. And they'll go out there and I, and they'll come back and say, well, yeah, I don't know. We're kind of doing the same thing. And I said, Exactly. And the thing is that what is the, nobody's got it right yet, you know, and, and it's the, I think the important thing is that everybody is doing something. It's like, you know, learning to swim without getting into the water. Jump in and, you know, take it from there. Um, <clears throat> and what I think is important is people are, again, moving out of the boundaries of their silos, working with new partners, establishing relationships, and the most important thing I think is providing, is having a focus on shared clients and shared outcomes for those clients. And there, there's where it starts. As, um, I think a, a not uncommon story is that I've seen is you have a behavioral health clinician or an expert counselor, uh, you know, go through a process and then out, outstations in a primary care clinic. And for the first month, you know, I'll hear, well, they're not, nobody's talked to them, nothing's happening. I don't know whether to reassign them or not. You know. About four months later, uh, oh, they're part of the team now. You know, they're, they love them. The, the docs, the nurses, they really get it. They, 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 and about nine months on, it's like, where do we send all our referrals? We've got all these clients that we've identified and we've got to send them someplace. And how can we you know, ramp up our, our uh, treatment uh, capacity? And then 12 months on, it's like nobody remembers the first month. You know, it's, <laughs> we're moving along. And I think that's the, the key thing. When we talk about, you know, it struck me yesterday, when we were talking about integration, and, you know, I think of the use of that term in a different context, and, and that of racial segregation in this country back in the 50s and 60s. And we talked about integration there meaning something quite different. But when desegregation started in the 60s, this was, I think there's some similarities. It was a difficult, untidy process. There was no roadmap. Uh, there was a lot of opposition. Uh, nobody knew exactly what this was going to look like. Uh, certainly people had a vision. Um, and it was a vision that, that kept people going, you know, not the blueprint. Nobody stopped because it was difficult, because workers for integration at schools, lunch counters, public transportation were stigmatized and, and even killed in some cases. Um, nobody stopped because they weren't being paid. Uh, and what keep, kept people going was that this was the right thing to do. So now, 
Two, today, under a rather less dramatic social backdrop, we have a similar task. You know, it is to bring mental health, substance use, and primary care together for the benefit of our clients. And, and this isn't, I think, as we know by now, not the bureaucratic exercise du jour that we're, um, we're taking the absolutely critical first steps. You know, even though this may unfold over the next 30 years, we're laying the foundation now. And we're going to you know, lay the steps for success or, or not in, in these early attempts at, at service integration. Um, <clears throat> and so these are the first steps in the creation of a national redesign of health care, a transformation of people's health. And thinking back to the 60s and Marv Southard's discussion about the social determinants of health, there's social justice here at the root of this. There is no reason today in this country why, you know, if you live in the wrong zip code, your life expectancy is 17, 20 years less than somebody else's. There's no excuse for that. So all I can say is stay on the bus. The ride's just getting started. It's going to be an interesting one. So thanks for all being here today. This is an interesting process. I was just joking a little bit that we'll have it done in two years, but uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see how far we can get in two years. <clears throat> so we're going to show just a short video that kind of illustrates what we're talking about with integration. Can you put the video up? Thank you. Pharmacies and behavioral health centers. When you have multiple health issues, you traditionally have to set up multiple appointments with these different specialists. Sometimes, people get help for only some of their concerns. When that happens, it's hard to get well. Although certain concerns may seem unrelated, they are all part of a whole person, a system, and it's hard for the person's health care provider to help them reach whole health and wellness unless they are aware of and know about all of the concerns. When they know all concerns, they can help the person decide which options for care may be more effective. There's a new approach, integrated health care. For people with multiple health concerns, including mental illness and addiction, health care providers are adopting integrated care practices. That means they are teaming up with other health care providers to increase access to primary and preventative medical care, mental health care, addictions treatment, and sometimes dentistry offering coordinated care, sometimes even in the same office. Community health centers and behavioral health centers are beginning to work together to provide services as a team and screen and refer people to each other's office for the services needed. A growing number of integrated care providers are in the same building. What does integrated care look like? Let's take a look. Meet Wendy. Wendy doesn't feel well. She has diabetes and bipolar disorder. Lately, Wendy's been sad and drained of energy. Last month, Wendy was in the hospital for complications from her diabetes. Now, she needs to refill her medications and wants to see someone about how she's been feeling. She could go to a health clinic to see a doctor or nutritionist for her diabetes, a separate behavioral health center to see a counselor and psychiatrist for her bipolar disorder, and then head over to the pharmacy to pick up her medications. This time, Wendy is going to a place in her neighborhood where she can get primary care, mental health care, and addictions treatment. When Wendy gets to the center, she meets Renita, the receptionist. Renita helps Wendy enroll in the center's care. Wendy tells Renita about how she was just in the hospital, and she tells her why she's come in today. Wendy explains how depressed she feels, how she wants to talk to a counselor, how she needs a psychiatrist for her mental health medication, and a doctor for her diabetes. Renita gives Wendy a screening form, where Wendy shares that she drinks heavily but would like to stop. Renita explains to Wendy how at their center she will have a caring team of professionals all at the same location to help her achieve her health goals. Renita then introduces Wendy to Nathan, the nurse. Nathan takes Wendy's blood sugar and is alarmed at how high it is. Wendy explains that she hasn't checked her blood sugar for a week because she doesn't own a blood sugar monitor and can't afford one. Wendy tells Nathan that she'd like to know how to take better care of herself. Nathan checks with Wendy's health insurance and sets up an appointment for Wendy to see a doctor on that same day. Wendy then sees Dr. Dynamite. Dr. Dynamite gives Wendy a physical, and while she's doing that, Wendy talks with the doctor about her bipolar disorder and diabetes. 
Dr. Dynamite writes Wendy a new prescription for her diabetes medication and suggests that Wendy meet with her colleague, Luis, to talk more about her bipolar disorder. Dr. Dynamite indicates that she will also talk with Luis about Wendy's diabetes so that everyone is on the same page. She asks Wendy to check in with Nurse Nathan every day that week so they can together monitor her blood sugar. While Wendy is waiting for Luis to come into the exam room, Nathan talks with Wendy about managing her blood sugar, eating right, gives her tips to drink less, and advises her about her medication. Nathan then introduces Wendy to Luis, the center's licensed clinical social worker. Wendy feels comfortable enough to share her experiences and talks with Luis about her recent symptoms. Luis asks Wendy if they can meet on a weekly basis to start. Luis asks Wendy if she'd like to meet with Pia, a peer counselor. Luis explains that peer counselors are individuals on the care team who have experienced getting help for a mental health or addiction concern themselves and are trained in helping people who are working toward recovery just like they have. Wendy agrees that she would like to meet with Pia. Luis also gives Wendy a list of some nearby support groups that can help Wendy reduce her drinking. Nathan, Luis, Dr. Dynamite, and the other professionals that help care for Wendy at the center each know the outcomes of their visits with Wendy in one electronic health record. Before she heads home, Wendy chats with Nathan, who will work with Wendy to ensure she continues receiving regular care. Then there's just one last stop. Wendy stops by the on-site pharmacy to pick up her prescriptions. All of Wendy's new caregivers talk about Wendy's progress in regular morning meetings. Nurse Nathan regularly checks on Wendy to make sure she has what she needs to manage her health and to feel better. Wendy is more confident in talking about her behavioral health and medical issues with Nurse Nathan, Peer Counselor Pia, and LCSW Luis. They see Wendy regularly to make sure she's feeling better and educate her how diabetes can sometimes worsen feelings of depression. Wendy now checks her blood sugar daily, takes her medication on schedule, and eats carefully. She is drinking less each week and is talking about giving up alcohol altogether. She attends a nutrition class at the center and walks every day to lose weight and to help control her diabetes. Her blood sugar is controlled, and with counseling and support, her symptoms of depression are reduced. Since starting this new integrated care, Wendy hasn't had to visit the emergency room or go into the hospital. Wendy is on her way to wellness.